So, you see, you're never too old to jump a fence. Mr Johnson, you should be setting a better example for the children. Yes, I should be setting a better example. Boy, do you run? Yes. Do you race? Yes. Would you like to race with me? Yes! Well, I'll race you later. <laughs> I'm a little bit tuckered out just now. You haven't been racing again. Well, I <laughs> rose early with a notion to call on the niece of Admiral Brodie down at Stowe House. So I walked around Stowe Pool and climbed over the gate and... You climbed over the gate? Whatever made you do a thing like that? Because I felt like it. Oh, many's the time I've shinned over that gate when I was a little boy, you know. Then Miss Brodie had the impertinence to suggest that I was too old to run a race. Too well, old. you are, Miss that's, Johnson. That's what she thought. So I challenged her. She said she would win because she was young. And I assured her that I would win because of experience. So we raced each other to the house. She got halfway there and then for some reason she she fell to laughing and tumbled over. So I won. <laughs> hey, you must be fitter than you look. No, no, my, my athletic exertions were so ridiculously grotesque that they made her laugh so she lost the race. <laughs> Mr Johnson, you have more spirit than Sense. Oh, so you know, when I was your age, young George, I used to read a lot. Do you read? No. But you know your letters. Of course I know my letters. Then Mrs. Chambers will teach you to read. No shortage of books in the bookshop, is the kitty? Well, no, Mr. Johnson, but I don't have time to teach this urchin. Hey, who are you calling an urchin? You, young George. <laughs> It is, George, a kind of crabfish that has prickles instead of feet. What? Formerly the name of a hedgehog, but used metaphorically, in this case, by Mrs. Chambers to um, signify a scruffy, ill-behaved boy. Me? <laughs> you. Anyway, what's so special about reading? Oh, well, for one thing, you could have found out the meaning of urchin for yourself, couldn't you? Dr Johnson wrote a dictionary where you can find out the meaning of words. Are you a doctor? You see, George, when you read, you can become part of the story. You could be, uh, one day, you could be a knight in shining armour. <laughs> a knight in shining armour, rescuing a damsel in distress. <laughs> He's done that before, he says. <laughs> Another day, you might be Sinbad on a magic carpet, fighting a terrible djinn. But I want to do things, not just sit and read. Quite right, too. Anyway, what did you used to do? Well, when I was a boy in this market square, they used to bring an old bear, and he'd be tied to an iron ring set in the cobblestones. And then a couple of dogs would come on until either the dogs or the bear were dead. It was cruel and fearful, but amused the folk of Litchfield City. Dr Johnson, you are frightening the boy. Am I frightening you, George? I've seen it last year. You ain't frightened me, mister. <laughs> you see, made of sterner stuff is George Piper. Wait till he sees a man dangling at the end of a rope. Mr. Johnson, he's too young for such things. It is as well for him to know of the horrors that his fellow men call entertainment. A Tyburn tree in London, 5,000 or more gather to watch a man hanged until death. Well, now he knows. Everybody knows that. They leave a man on the jibber so they go maggoty and rotten and their eyes fall out. <laughs> Therefore, friends, find solace in the things that cause no harm. Eat, drink, and be merry. You can hardly encourage a boy to drink. No, but these good citizens of Litchfield can. 
Why, I knew a time when every respectable citizen of Litchfield got drunk every Friday night. There is nothing yet contrived by man by which so much happiness is produced as by a good inn or tavern. I forget all my cares when I'm in the company at an inn. A tavern chair is the throne of human happiness. And I never drink anything but lemonade. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, what are you saying? That we should become a city of drunkards and make animals of ourselves. There is a reason why men drink and make animals of themselves. They want to forget the misery of being human. I like to have looks. So you go with the sheriff's right. Would you now? Well, now my father, Alderman Michael Johnson, was actually the sheriff of Litchfield. Did he really? Really. And he used to organise the ride and the sheriff's breakfast. Did he used to hunt as well? Hunt? Hunt? No, my father was not a hunting man, except <laughs> when he was hunting for books. Oh. I'd like to go hunting. What on earth? <coughs> what on earth for? Because I can go on this share of flight. Well, it is exciting. All the dogs and horses and horns, everyone tearing across the fields. I pinched your line. <laughs> uh, you mean, what on earth for? It's exciting. All the dogs and horns and horses tearing across the fields. Well, there's an echo around here. Ah, yes. Well, I've been more hunting more than once, you know. On one outing, I rode 50 miles. Believe me, hunting's not what it's cracked up to be, you know. Leaving aside the fear and bloody fate of the fox, which is horrible to witness, riding so far gives you a pain in the... <laughs> in the, um... In the fundament. Dr. Johnson. Yes, Miss Chambers. What, when I went hunting with Mr. Thrale, everyone thought I was very brave indeed. Why was that? Well, I rode very fast. And when I came towards a hedge or a ditch, I would spur my horse to go straight over. But you once went straight on through. Well, frequently happened. I did go straight through the hedge. <laughs> that sounds very brave, Mr. Johnson. Most of the hunt would dismount and walk their horses around the obstacle. But you went straight through. I did go straight through. Where did I go? You went straight, straight through. through, yes. I was too idle to get off. Sport must be a poor thing if, if hunting is called a sport. George, do you swim? Yes, missus. No, I mean no. Make your mind up, George. George, if you can't swim, but you'll never drown if you can swim. My father taught me to swim, you know, in, in the mill pool at Stowe. I had great fun. The other year, I was swimming in the sea at Brighton. A man's got to be a blockhead if he ever wrote except for money. You mean you can make a living just from writing? Well, I certainly do. But only if people want to read what I've written. I like to get a book out and read with works for the day. I'm lucky to have a shop full of them. Yes, there's more than to life than just making a living. As you can see, I spend most of my time eating. I'm quite an expert, you know. Hey, I could write a cookery book <laughs> if I chose to. What's your favourite? Mine's cow cheek. Well stewed. Now, I love a leg of pork, cooked till the meat falls off the bone. And fruit. Mr. Thrale, my friend in London, has a hot house where he grows marrows and grapes and peaches. My favourites are peaches. I can eat four or five before breakfast. 
four or five more after breakfast, I can tell you. That reminds me, Mr. Johnson, there's a small barrel of pippins for you at the shop. Mr. Green left for them for you to take back to London. Mr. Green knows his way into my affections. So, George, what else might you do? Do not. I walk everywhere in London, of course, and sometimes I do very complicated arithmetical calculations in my head. Purely for fun, you understand? Don't sound that much fun. Oh, it isn't. But it does pass the time when no one else is around. A man has to keep his mind occupied, otherwise it tends towards melancholy. Of course, if there's anyone about, I'll talk to them. Hello. And you certainly can talk, can't you, Dr. Johnson? Oh, there's no greater pleasure than sitting and having a good talk out with your best friends. But my old dad only talks about which horse were in the cup and waiting for me, Francis. Oh, I talk about all sorts of things. Books, politics, family, crime and punishment. Scandal! Scandal? Oh, such stuff as my actor friends Jubilee, Shakespeare at Stratford. Davy Garrick spent thousands of pounds only to see the whole thing swamped in an almighty downpour which caused the Avon to flood. Do you talk about poetry? What? Poetry? What's poetry? Writing. Versification. You must know your rhymes. Kitty. What? Uh, nursery rhyme. My head is full of Grey's cucumber sonnets. I don't have much use for nursery rhymes, being an unmarried person. Well, exert your faculty of remembrance then, Kitty. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one. The mouse was gone. Hickory dickory dock. The lady over there knows that one as well. You must know that one, George. Of course I do. It's not much to talk about, Bob, is it? No. But what if I was to recite some Shakespeare? That time of year, thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. There, brewing choirs, where late the sweet birds sang. To me, fair friend, you never shall be old. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, my dear friend. Long get off it. When I was your age, my, my uncle Andrew, who was a, a pretty tricksy fellow, taught me to box. Wow, you can teach me. With one hand behind my back. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, this could be a disaster. That big what's in rehearsals. Where are those highway nets? Good job I bought these from the pound shop. Newfound contraption of the 18th century. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> you go to the theatre too, Mr. Johnson. Oh, yes. Actors and actresses. Interesting to talk to and to watch with one eye. You know, you know the theatre in Bore Street, George? Well, I remember going there to see Jamie Garrick. I had a chair on the side of the stage, and when I left this seat for a minute, I went back, and there was a lout sitting in my chair. A lout. What did you do? I was vexed, and I threw him and the chair into the pit. I told you I could get wild if I was annoyed. <laughs> Garrick has banned all seats from the stage in Drury Lane now. Perhaps he wants to avoid a repeat performance. Then there's more.
imagine. I do not dance. I do not have the um, bill for dancing, nor do I have the ear for the music. One day, I should like to go to a ball just once. Now, George Piper, how would you like to come with me to my house and we'll have a, a cup of chocolate? Yes, please, Mr. Johnson. Don't you think the lad's too young for chocolate, Mr. Johnson? No, Kitty, my mother always gave me chocolate. And I'm none the worse for it. There are games of plenty to entertain you in that old house. I've never had chocolate. Oh, you'll like it, believe me, Master Piper. And afterwards, Master Piper, we'll perhaps essay to Levitt's Field for some boxing. <laughs> and uh, perhaps some fence jumping, if you're big enough. I am big enough, sir. And we might even have time for a game of vowels. <laughs> Come on, George, let's go to my house.